Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TDWI webinar program. I'm Andrew Miller, and I'll be your moderator. For today's program, we're going to talk about getting your data infrastructure ready for generative AI. And our sponsor today is Impetus. For our presentations today, we'll hear first from Fern Halper with TDWI. And after Fern speaks, we'll be joined by Ravi Shankar, Rao Vahabjosila, and Derek Larson for a fireside chat. Before I turn over the time to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few basics. Today's webinar will be about an hour long, and at the end of their presentations, our speakers will host a question and answer period. So if at any time during these presentations you'd like to submit a question, just use the Ask a, Qu Ask a Question area on your screen to type in your question. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can click on the Technical FAQs area and you'll receive technical assistance. And if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, please locate the resource window to download the PDF. Lastly, we are recording today's event and we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version so you can view the presentation, presentation again later if you choose or if you'd like to share with a colleague. Again, today we're going to be discussing getting your data infrastructure ready for generative AI and our first speaker is Fern Halper. She's the Vice President and Senior Director of TDWI Research for Advanced Analytics. Fern is well known in the analytics community, having been published hundreds of times on data mining and information technology over the past 20 years. Fern is also the co-author of several dummies books on cloud computing and big data. She focuses on advanced analytics, including predictive analytics, machine learning, AI, cognitive computing, and big data analytics approaches. Fern has also been a partner at industry analyst firm Hurwitz & Associates and a lead data analyst for Bell Labs. She's also taught at both Colgate University and Bentley University, and her PhD is from Texas A&M University. Welcome, Fern, and with that, I'll hand it over to you now. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us on this webinar about getting your data infrastructure ready for generative AI. It's an important topic as organizations look to deploy generative AI on their data. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to provide an overview of generative AI and the state of market adoption that we're seeing at TDWI. I'll talk about the challenges with generative AI, and I'll also talk about some of the infrastructure components involved with it. But we're gonna spend most of the hour in a panel session with our experts discussing infrastructure components and implementing solutions. So what is generative AI? I think most of you probably know by now, but I, I, I feel the need to give you a definition. It is, It refers to artificial intelligence systems that are designed to create new outputs, such as images and music and text or other forms of media that's based on the input that they're trained on. So the key word here is generate, you know, in generative AI. So the idea behind generative AI is that the system is generating output based on its training. So probably most of you have used ChatGPT or BERT or some kind of generative AI system, you know, or at least played with it. And, you know, where you ask it via a prompt to generate a piece of written content for you, and it's generating that output. So what we're seeing at TDWI is that many organizations are interested in using generative AI on their own data um, and applications because that's where their unique advantage lies, you know, in your own data. So for instance, uh, there are a number of examples of applications that can use your company's data. And we'll talk about this more in the panel, but I've listed some of them here. And these, these all depend on a foundation model, which provides a broad base of knowledge in a domain such as a large language model like GPT-4, you know, which is what ChatGPT is based on. And that model has been trained on a large corpus of data, you know, which is the internet basically. And it's trained on billions, GPT-4 was trained on billions of parameters to be able to predict which words statistically come next within the response to a user inputted textual prompt. Um, so that's why, you know, when you put in your prompt, it appears that the system is understanding the meaning of the words that you've written, you know, even though it's, you know, really just a lot of statistics behind the scene, a lot of, um, you know, um, a lot of um, machine learning, et cetera. Um, so some examples, as I said, so I could ask a, trust, a customer support chat bot um, about how to fix a certain product, 
but it might just provide me with general information about fixing, you know, the kind of class of product that I'm asking about. If I wanted to be specific about a new model that had new features, um, and maybe that information hadn't been published yet, so it wasn't able to train on that, you know, I'd want to use my own company product data to support that chatbot. I mean, I'd also want to bring in information about the customer on the chatbot to see what segment they fall into as part of a customer experience. So in other words, I need my own data. So some other examples of applications that would use company data would also include things like sentiment analysis. Um, so here, this is a different kind of example, and I might want to understand the sentiment of call center notes on specific topics. So I'd give the model some examples and say whether, you know, for example, that, that was a positive statement, you know, that the that the caller said a negative one, a neutral one, or, you know, somewhere in between. But I wouldn't really want to use my own call center notes on a public platform. I'd want to bring that behind my behind my firewall. You know, another example is a recommendation system. We actually had a talk about a system like this in our executive summit. We had an executive summit in Orlando next week. And, you know, there was interesting. There were two parts to the system. There was a recommendation system that recommends a product for a specific customer, you know, and that was using your basic predictive analytics. And then there was a generative AI piece that created the pitch for the salesperson. So again, using company data, you could say, generate me a sales pitch for a certain kind of product, you know, but you'd really want to use, you know, the company, your own company, your own product, you know, um, in the tone that would make sense for a specific type of customer. Um, and finally, you know, how about personalized marketing content? So you may know that your customer segments, you may know, you know, what customers are in what segments, and maybe you can rank your customers in a segment, but then you might want to use generative AI to generate the email message for the campaign. So again, you know, using data to build the application. So I'm saying that the foundation model provides a broad base of knowledge in the respective domain, you know, but you're using your own data, you know, to really make it yours and to, to build these applications. And since, you know, you're doing that, you really most likely don't want to do it using public, um, public models, which is why we see a lot of organizations, you know, wanting to build this, you know, behind their firewalls. So what we see at TDWI is a growing interest in generative AI. So this question was part of a best practices report survey that we conducted earlier this year. Um, and in it, we asked which of these AI ML technologies are you using or planning to use for modern analytics? And so the dark green is using now, and then the gray is planning to use in the next few years. And you know, you could see a whole list of them. And by the way, this question was asked only of organizations that were using more advanced analytics like machine learning, for example. And so you could see that 59% were already using machine learning, another 30% wanted to do so. That's the top bars there. Um, you know, and you, you can read down the list in terms of some of these technologies, natural language understanding, speech recognition, and so on. And we asked specifically about generative AI for language, for image, and for voice. And you could see that about 16% are using it for language and for image now, but another 30% or over 30%, I should say, are expecting to do this in the next year or two. Um, so, you know, definitely interest is growing. And, the, and this um, survey was done even before sort of the big, you know, hoo-ha-ha -ha around generative AI um, happened. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't challenges. I mean, you could see that a top challenge is around data privacy and security. So we asked, this was actually in a webinar we did on the topic a few months ago. And so you could see that organizations are concerned, you know, about privacy and security, you know, so they're probably concerned about using public platforms with their company's data. You know, they aren't sure yet how to move a foundation model to their own environment to ensure that they can keep the data private. Uh, there, they're concerned about other things, you know, things like skills shortages, you know, this is new and there are skills that need to be um, put in place, maybe around building applications, um, you know, dealing with foundation models, fine tuning models, 
You know, there's concern about a lack of trust in terms of hallucinations, um, which is where the foundation, where the model is actually outputting something that sounds authoritative, but it's wrong. Um, and the complexity involved in integrating uh, with current systems. So again, you know, skills issues, technology challenges, um, et cetera. So companies also realize that they need a solid foundation, solid data foundation to support generative AI. So a platform or an environment that can support diverse data types, that's gonna be very important as organizations begin to build out new applications. The chatbots, you know, think about the chatbots or other applications that are gonna use text data or other unstructured data types. You know, do you have the data infrastructure to support that, for instance? You know, there are also new components that are gonna be involved with generative AI applications and new approaches um, as well that are gonna to need to be considered. And I've listed a few here, you know, things like the foundation models, like the large language models, which we talked about, um, new databases, like vector databases, new approaches, say new fine tuning approaches, you know, fine, fine tuning a foundation model that's now part of your environment. Um, how would you do that? You know, new security and governance approaches uh, for this new technology. So I'm gonna go through each of these very quickly and we're gonna talk about, you know, that and more or them and more in the panel discussion. So the first is the foundation model. You know, and we talked about this as a model that it's been built and trained and then optimized on a wide range for a wide range of tasks. You know, what you could see in this diagram, this is a diagram from Stanford. You know, so again, you know, where is this model? Is it something that you built from scratch or using an open source model or a commercial model? That's, you know, these are available for use. Um, you know, does, does that model require a lot of compute to train it, you know, yeah, if you're gonna build one from scratch, which is why a lot of organizations are using pre-trained models, pre-trained models and then bringing them into their environment. So the foundation model is one component. Another component is a vector database. Uh, these have been around for a while and you know they were designed to store, retrieve and manage highly dimensional vector representations of data efficiently. So some applications in generative AI are gonna require this. You know, so these vectors are numerical representations of data. And I put an example here on this chart. Um, each word in a sentence can be converted into a vector using a pre-trained word embedding model. So you, you know, take, take the information, the, the unstructured text data, you um, run it through a word embedding model and that creates what's called an embedding which is a representation of any kind of data as a vector, you know, which is a string of string of numbers. Um, that that information, that data is stored in the vector database, and that can be used as input into a generative AI model. And we'll talk. We could talk more about that. You know, there are also new approaches for tuning a model. So you may have heard of the term fine tuning to tune a machine learning model. So to, you train it you tune the hyperparameters, you know, the weights, you validate it and you test it. You know, for generative AI, these, these models can be tuned too. Um, and, and, you know, and in some instances, if you're gonna fine tune the model that can change the weights, you know, in the model, but there are also new approaches that are um, out there in the market. There's recent approaches that we've been hearing about, things called prompt tuning, for example, which doesn't change the parameters in the model. So instead of modifying the model itself, prompt tuning focuses on iteratively refining the prompts given to the model to achieve the desired result. There's also retrieval augmented intelligence that sort of fits somewhere between fine tuning and prompt tuning. Um, it retrieves certain information and then sends that information plus the prompt to the foundation model. So it's basically providing contextual information to the foundation model. And this approach is getting a lot of attention because it's less compute intensive than fine tuning. Um, so those are some of the components, you know, the foundation model, um, how you're gonna give it data about your company, how you're gonna represent that data potentially, you know, as vector um, embeddings, et cetera. And then finally, I wanna bring up some 
security and governance issues, which you know are, are really important components of all data and analytics projects, and generative AI is no exception. And so we talked about hallucinations. Um, how do you put governance in place for hallucinations? You know, there's also data privacy in terms of exposing sensitive data, so you're going to have to plan for that. You're going to have to keep up to date on new regulations associated with AI. You know, so for example, back in June, um, the Senate announced the Safe um, Innovation Framework, which set priorities for AI legislation in the U.S. You know, fo focusing on things like security and accountability and explainability. Um, I don't think it's going to pass in 2023, but Congress is working on it. You know, the EU is putting legislation in place. They have something called the AI Act. You know, they also have something that's called the AI Liability Directive, which sounds like what it is. Um, you know, so that there are concerns around ethical and responsible AI. And I think that that has moved much more quickly with the advent of generative AI. So, you know, in summary, Generative AI is where the action is, and many organizations are being asked by their executives what they're going to do about it. Um, and you know what to do about it may often involve your company's data as part of the innovations that you're going to create. And there are going to be new components involved with this, such as new databases, new governance concerns, you know, maybe new collaboration between developers and data scientists um, for building applications and issues like fine tuning. Um, models and getting data into context for generative AI applications. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to turn it over to Andrew in a second, and we're going to bring our experts on. But first, we wanted to ask you a a poll question. You know, which is basically where are you in your generative AI journey? And please just you know answer one. Um, experimentation is happening in certain parts of the business, so is, is that what's happening right now? Or are you focusing on the right data strategy and other foundation elements, you know, to start to start the ball rolling? Or is enterprise generative AI, is the strategy in place and solutions being scaled? Or industry risk barriers reduce the viability of Gen AI for my organization? Um, you know, so you're, you're fighting um, to try to get even get something in place, or there's just, you know, skeptic, skeptability, that's not really a word, of generative AI and not currently pursuing it. So you can select one of um, these answers. I see some people answering in the, uh, in the chat box. So you can actually select one of these, um, you know, about experimentation or you trying to put the strategy together? Is it in place? You know, are you worrying about the risks or, you know, is it just, you're all pretty skeptical about this? So I'm gonna let a few more, a few more responses come in and let's see what we have. Okay, let's see what we have here. So it looks like, okay, well, they're very interesting. So it's, it, people are, are starting to actually experiment and, and focus on the right data strategy and other foundational elements for generative AI um, applications, it looks like. So that's, that's, very interesting. All right. Well, with that, let me hand it over. So I think we're going to be at the right level of detail for you all um, in our in our discussion here. So with that, Andrew, let me hand it over to you to introduce our experts. Thank you very much, Fern. That was a great presentation. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today. First of which is Ravi Shankar Rao Vahabjosala with Impetus. Ravi leads the data science practice at Impetus, and he has contributed extensively to various AI and ML initiatives. He has been involved in delivering successful data science engagements for several customers, and Ravi has over two decades of experience working with data modeling and simulation and machine learning and engineering design, manufacturing, energy, aerospace, life sciences, healthcare, and other areas. We're also joined by Derek Larson with Impetus. 
Derek is a recognized leader in digitizing the customer experience and capitalizing on disruption at the intersection of technology advancements and data science. Working directly with Fortune 500 and governmental entities, he is well versed in the design and launch of product offerings that propel growth organically and capitalize on assets from inorganic acquisitions. He has over 15 years of experience enabling co commercial companies to redefine their products and services and empowering governmental agencies to define and realize their mission promises. Welcome to both Ravi and Derek. And with that, Fern, I'll pass it back over to you for the discussion. Okay, great. Um, so my first question is for Derek. Adjust this so we all look like we're the same height here. Okay, <laughs> okay, good. Um, so Derek, my first question is for you, You know, which is how would you define readiness for generative AI and where should organizations start with the foundational elements? And do you have any other foundational elements to add? That's what I've been talking about. Yeah, thanks, Fern. Uh, thanks for the question. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, it's a, a great place to start. <clears throat> and I think it's easy to sit back and, and, and think of the solutions and features that are best suited for Gen AI, uh, specifically that technology within your company. But first, we must ask ourselves, you know, and, and it, it's kind of building on what you were talking about for, do I have a Gen AI strategy in place? You know, do I have that doctrine that's going to guide decision making and provide that North Star for us? If you have that, then you can start thinking about what are the use cases while considering feasibility timelines, the ability to monetize an overall ROI. So those are going to help you prioritize and select the, the particular use cases you want to pursue. Uh, but first, but even before you even get into that, we like to think about the growth frontiers of Gen AI uh, at Impetus, and it really uh, falls along these, these key dimensions. Strategy and architecture, having the right foundation, you talked a lot about this from a, a data perspective, the governance and responsible Gen AI, are you the ability to contextualize and enrich Gen AI? and the ability to scale Gen AI. So I think you hit on those first four, some of the, the ability to scale. And what I mean by scaling is, is okay, great. We have all this, we've addressed our data you know, infrastructure, but can I scale this? Can I, can I really industrialize Gen AI uh, across my organization with LLM ops, which is building on the traditional ML ops? Um, do I have those, those, that structure in place? So when I want to build these apps, it's almost like a factory. Uh, in the organization. So those are really the dimensions that that we like to key on when we talk about readiness. But at the end of the day, passing go and collecting that $200 on the Gen AI Monopoly board game requires you to honestly assess your company's readiness to pursue um, the, the most promising solutions. Do you have a clear understanding of how to unify, store, analyze, and apply data at scale, especially a scale that's exponential in, in the world of Gen AI? Um, and these are the fundamental capabilities that 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 really how you how you can confidently say you are ready for Gen AI. Um, Ravi will have more to to share on data strategy and specifically data architecture and engineering um, as we progress. And and so when you say contextualize, do you mean like how to feed contextual information to the system so that it it works for your organization? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned when you were talking about the the rag and the the vector embeddings and all of that. So I can have an LLM that's trained on publicly available information, but it doesn't go very far in in the context of the industry or the organization that I that I'm I'm working within. So I need to to contextualize and enrich my my Gen AI solutions by doing that, and I need to make sure that I have, you know, the data set, but also the governance and the controls such that. I'm producing results that are trusted, safe, uh, and, 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 and abide by kind of the, the governance principles that I lay out as part of my Gen AI strategy. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought you meant. I just wanted to make sure and clarify that for the audience if there were any questions um, around that. I mean, you know, just let me ask you one other question. I mean, do you think any organization could be ready for generative AI? I mean, it sounds like no. I guess I'm thinking, you know, that a lot of the organizations that we talk to, they're sort of moving into AI. They were doing, you know, sort of self-service, slicing and dicing, you know, democratizing their analytics. They're trying to put machine learning in place. They may have some machine learning, you know, models. Um, 
but would it be okay for them just to sort of jump into generative AI if they could find the right use case and, and they had, you know, these other elements in place? I think the key to key to, to answer your question is yes, if all those elements are in place, certainly. And and I think the 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 poll question and the answers that came about from that kind of uh, back that up. You know, you see a lot of experimentation, you see a lot of of exploration of Gen AI and how it can can work within the organization, and that's awesome. Um, and, and really, that's the value of Gen AI and and, and, and democratizing that. You've used that term uh, quite a bit, which I think is great. Um, but at the end of the day, unless unless you have these foundational capabilities in place, it's not going to go very far. You're not going to realize the full value of what Gen AI and the solutions you're trying to pursue. So that's what we talk about readiness. And then you know the second most highest uh, poll response was people focusing on that data foundation, um, which I, I, I will continue to to say is the key uh, to unlocking what Gen AI can do for your company and, and your customers. So Robbie, how about, how has Gen AI changed the way that you think about data strategy and and the underlying architecture and infrastructure? How should it be integrated? Thank you, Fern, and thanks, uh, Andrew, and uh, uh, Derek also for highlighting everything uh, up to this point. It's uh, great to see uh, the poll results as well, and uh, Fern, I think your question is right on the uh, Target essentially the data strategy is critical to all of this, and what we are seeing is uh, primarily uh, the organizations that uh, are using Genai today are either experimenting or contemplating how to build the data strategy, uh, and sometimes both of them are going together. Uh, often you're trying to do a data strategy as you're trying to do a few projects at work and establish the value, and then go from beyond that. Now, well, as part of that data strategy we have to kind of dig deeper into like what is possible in terms of creating a roadmap to understand where we are on a readiness and maturity level and what does it take for you to go from there to a state where you're fully leveraging gen ai uh, with uh, you know enterprise grade production use cases and that's the challenge right so essentially you need to not only figure out all the aspects of the data and infrastructure because they are to be harmonized now uh, and uh, second point is also to kind of figure out which customer use cases might be more important. And there you need to look at prioritizing those use cases like Derek mentioned. And that will depend on what is the impact, what's the value for those use cases. And uh, primarily that will also be driven by revenue considerations and many other things that are uh, broader. Now, uh, feeding into all of this is of course the, the governance and the guardrails and other aspects which you talked about hallucinations and so for so using off the shelf uh, publicly available or you know commercial gpt uh, versions could be good to a starting point but at some point you to you need to kind of figure out how to get that into an enterprise scale so either you do build those models within your uh, vaults or you have to be able to fine tune open source models and kind of build those uh, you know guardrails and things around those so ultimately it will also depend on what kind of llms uh, large language models you're going with because there are pros and cons of choosing those uh, and more better versions are going to be coming down the road. So how easy is it for you to switch out those? So all of these will play into the data strategy uh, ultimately. And uh, of course, the infrastructure is critical for all of this. And we have various architectures and things that people have kind of created. And now figuring out how to kind of uh, build all the things, like you talked about fine tuning, RAG, and all of those, so vector databases. So all of connecting all of these together, but at the end of the day, these uh, large language models will have to kind of be integrated into the downstream applications and enable them to uh, deliver value to the customers. So we are kind of working with all these areas and kind of kind of build that capability for enterprises. So we're happy to talk more in more detail. Um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm curious about like, what's a simple architecture like um, that you know, or is there a simple architecture um, involved, you know, with generative yeah. AI? Definitely, this is a great question, right? So uh, primarily when you think of generative AI, you're thinking about this huge complex uh, structure that needs so many moving parts. Now at, at a very simplistic scale, generative AI is nothing but a generative process. It's a model that's just creating text or, you know, images or things similar to what it has seen before. 
Now, uh, that has been there for a long time. Now, it's just that the ac accessibility and the uh, you know ability to generate text and content of all kinds of things has really enabled uh, GenAI to really catch on. Now, if you look at it, the simplistic distribution of the original data. And in case of text, it is primarily figuring out the relationship between all the words and sentences and trying to create text based on the prompt that you give it. So essentially you're trying to get to the response as closest to your answer. And that's why prompt tuning and other things are important. So a very simple architecture could be that you're taking all the documents that exist in your, in your uh, data store or could be enterprise and indexing them up. And essentially you have, could have an indexing engine and then uh, you could essentially hit that index with the search query and uh, feed that into like a large language model and that can summarize it for you. So that would be a enterprise search kind of a use case. But what can enable further is adding uh, ability to bring in embeddings and uh, you know the things to do around uh, new documents that got dropped in. So we need to kind of figure out all of those components. So each of those brings in additional layer of complexity and uh, kind of layering it out uh, one by one uh, and enabling you to build the app on the top of the uh, that layered application stack is what is uh, the good way to go. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And, and I think we're getting into talking about some use cases. So Derek, what are the use cases or solutions that you see that are being pursued with your customers and what are some of the challenges that they're facing? Certainly, um, I think you know as as Gen AI is advancing so fast, you start to hear stories of where uh, you're seeing more prevailing usage of Gen AI in an enterprise situation. I was just um, in Atlanta a couple of weeks ago speaking with uh, an individual that was working for an insurance company and how they were using Gen AI in the claims process, which was fascinating to me because I, I was asking him as to why they are so fast and so far ahead of the curve when it comes to deploying that. And he got back to you know, all the stuff we've been talking about. We, we've, we've along the way, even before Gen AI was a thing, we're, we're thinking about our data strategy. So I think that that's just proof and point that having that in place allowed that success story to, to proceed. The reason I brought it up is because the success stories, you know, beyond, um, you know, these experimental POCs are largely reserved for internal applications. Um, you've seen McKinsey use it for enterprise search. Um, and that's a prevailing one that you see a lot of that as well, because it's internal, it's using internal data for the, the enterprise uh, for that particular organization. And it's not going outside of the walls. Uh, so it's protected in that, in that regard. So it allows them to, to use it. Um, broadly, uh, I think the, the bulk of uh, Gen AI value and from a use case perspective will revolve around customer operations, think uh, customer experience and agent productivity in, in those interactions, call centers, contact centers, marketing and in sales, you know, content creation, personalization. Um, uh, we at Empetus, we're actually seeing it, you, we're using it uh, for software development, uh, both from coding uh, creating and, 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 and maintaining documentation. Um, you're also seeing some of it along the, the product R and D, you know, uh, from a testing perspective in the healthcare space. So those are some of the use cases that are largely going to be those that are going to be on the front end. There's tons of literature and write-ups on the seemingly endless possibilities of solutions, uh, that go horizontal and are industry specific. Um, but as I mentioned, they're tantalizing to think about, but there's still some work before we, we get there. Uh, if you look to the challenges, um, I think it really revolves around these six. Uh, we've mentioned a lot on establishing that data infrastructure and foundation, so that there's a challenge in that because you, you're you're looking at, at integrating and unifying data at a scale that's never been uh, attacked before, because uh, that's what Gen AI requires. Um, we've talked about the open source and proprietary technology, the decisions uh, around that. Uh, that's a challenge uh, for all of us to consider and, and work through. Um, the proper use cases, uh, Ravi mentioned a little bit about that, but you want to make sure that they're not only delivering value, but they're trusted and secure uh, in, in what, they're, what they're delivering, both internally and externally to your customers. Um, Deployment of LLMs and the integration and security with your company's proprietary data. 
ethical and responsible Gen AI. You know, we have a, you mentioned earlier, there's a fluid regulatory landscape that we find ourselves in. So how do we, uh, you know, traverse that, but also ensure that what we're doing is ethical and responsible. So that burden falls on the on the company. Uh, I think the the regulatory landscape is is a little bit behind uh, from where we are. I don't think anyone would, would argue that point. So it re largely relies on us and when we're deploying this to to think about those ethical and responsible uh, considerations. Um, and last but not least, I mentioned this earlier. Um, ML ops has been around for a bit, model ops for traditional um, AI and ML. With Gen AI, it goes well beyond that. Um, and, and we had impetus, you know, ascribed to the, the, the position that LLM ops is going to be uh, the, the requirement for, for Gen AI. And you got to think about all the tuning that you mentioned earlier, how to think about those data pipelines, how do you set those up? And then, you know, how do you make sure that those models are trained, um, and deployed into production, maintained and monitored. So uh, I think that those are the challenges. Those are six and they're not meant to scare you. It's just make, to make sure, <laughs> ensure that you have a clear eye when you're going into Gen AI and thinking about how it works for your organization. You know, talking about one of them, Robbie, how would you go about choosing between an open source and a proprietary LLM? And, and then the subsequent yeah. modifications or fine tuning, you know, because there are options for both. So how should an organization think about that? Yeah, that's a very um, important question, uh, primarily from point of view, not only just experimenting, but also being able to build that as a comprehensive uh, application. Now there are copyright issues and there's concern around uh, the models that are uh, being trained on public data having consume data that's, uh, you know, uh, has some copyright or other information. So there's concern of that output being generated also uh, being involved. So how do you tackle those kind of issues? So one important aspect is uh, for simple use cases, which doesn't involve any, uh, let's say, PI data or anything, uh, where you just try to show some value initial stages, uh, you're restricting it to publicly available information. Maybe uh, some public uh, proprietary GPT kind of uh, versions might be reasonably okay to show value. Once you start building more complex applications, uh, it might be better to kind of uh, build those LLMs within your walls. And for that, uh, you can take a lot of very capable open source models uh, and LLMs. And in fact, there was a paper uh, recently which showed that the uh, starting from about 7 billion parameters, these models start showing really good uh, capability, in, especially with uh, uh, math and text, they're all pretty much good at even lower levels, but uh, lightweight models like uh, the Falcon and uh, various others like Llama. So even 7D models are good enough to start with. So essentially now you have to have a choice of uh, bringing your data to these open source models and fine tuning those, uh, uh, which could continuously be a continuous process that uh, learns from the data as it's dropped in. Now, uh, once you have the model trained, now you're able to kind of figure out uh, performance, you need to track observability and you need to make sure that it's hitting all the uh, you know, performance metrics that you wanted to hit. Now, uh, the models will continue to get better. And at some point you need to, if you think uh, there's another open source model that serves you better, uh, you can test it and replace the one that you have. Then there are uh, strategies and also there are also platforms that are providing goes today uh, as part of tooling and a lot of uh, improvements and enhancements that are happening to these LLMs as well. And we're just talking about LLMs today. There's also vision models and vision transformers coming down the road and multimodal apps. So all these will be important. Right, right. It's true. Everyone talks about LLMs like it's the only thing, but you know, there are these other types of models too, but I think it's the LLMs at least are a good place to start. And I liked, you know, that your sort of phased approach there. Okay, so we talked about some use cases, the architecture, um, um, you know, a, a phased sort of approach. Derek, how would you design a generative AI adoption strategy across the organization or business? Yeah, it's a it's it's an awesome question, and and I think you know when you think about Jet AI and we talk about the promise, you're you're going to find some 
folks that I'll call acolytes, like they 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 think it's the best thing ever, and they're they're your probably easiest uh, cohort of folks to to get excited about Gen AI. Uh, there's going to be skeptics. There's going to be some that are unsure of it. So uh, we believe that if you start with a, a Gen AI strategy, and, and really that is the your ability to communicate its value for the entire org, but also personalize that message so everyone understands how Gen AI impacts their, not only their job, but what they're working on and, and how does that evolve and advance what they're doing and how they interact with each other and with customers. Um, you know, because that is the ethos. That is that is how you you demonstrate what Gen AI is is meant to be for your organization, how you want it to, to to be utilized, uh, and you're giving you're giving your folks uh, a view into that. Next is ensuring there's trust in your design, and and that 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 coincides with plans that are focused on governance and security of data. So giving people that sense of of of, of comfort and and knowing that that is being considered, it's being addressed, it's being managed, and it's part of it because it's so much that people talk about now that it's going to be something that people are going to have in the back of their minds. So you make sure you have to make sure that you're addressing that. Um, kind of in the same vein as trust in, in security, but you also want to make sure that you're accounting for the accuracy and the consistency of, of those outputs. So proper training is critical, you know, training the AI on high quality data that is complete, correct, up to date. So you're getting those accurate, reliable answers. Um, that's that's up front, but it's also making sure that you're working with your your team, your your team of humans that you work with, uh, so that they are asking the right questions, refining their queries, you know, providing them with with documentation, and and capturing you know kind of the the knowledge of their interactions um, in, in Gen AI, and that really is a you know traditional terms is called your knowledge management strategy. Uh, that can be applied in the in the world of Gen AI as well. So that's where we want to make sure that we're talking about accuracy and consistency of outputs. So the training of the models, you know, I talked about LLM ops, you know, that's where the monitoring and managing of those models and the outputs uh, come into play as well. So if we're doing that, another thing that you can, can look to is uh, call it a factory, call it whatever you want for, for Gen AI, but it's, it's a, it's a forcing function for your organization to develop these solutions fast uh, with repeatable and a, with a repeatable and a verifiable framework. Um, and I will add that this, we don't make, make this to be a sandbox. I think with Gen AI, you have to get out of the, the mindset of, of, a, of a sandbox where you're using kind of fake data or things of that nature. With Gen AI, it's happening too fast and, and having that real world data is a way for your organization to learn and it's also utilizing or, or capitalizing on gen ai but furthermore it's going back to the previous points that i was talking about with your with your organization you may have some people that may be skeptical so showing them and demonstrating them with their data that they're using on the, on the business side that's very powerful um, so don't think of it as a sandbox that's isolated uh, but you're doing it in, with uh, in a responsible way in, in, in working through that. So I think if you go along those dimensions, it's a great way to to start with start and and, and purposefully uh, put an adoption strategy for Gen AI together. For yeah, and, and you touched upon you know in terms of the adoption strategy, you, you touched upon you know so, sort of responsible AI and, and trusted and governed. So Robbie. You know, what are some governance and responsible AI guidelines that will actually reduce the risk and put the right safeguards in yeah. place with generative AI? I see that's also a question that people are asking um, in Definitely. the chat. So. Yeah, that is actually, thank you, thank you, Fun. And uh, I think I see those questions as well. It's interesting because this is a very con concerning issue for many uh, you know, enterprises and people who are using uh, these. Uh, generative AI and large language models. So one aspect that comes out of it is there's more and more uh, direct talked about is how do you create high quality data? One concern there is your, some of that data might be coming from other AI generated uh, in applications. So, I mean, Gen AI generated applications. So, and they might be hallucinations within that data. So how do you make sure? So there's important, uh, uh, you know, pieces we need to add in terms of uh, uh, being able to 
detect uh, things like uh, for example misinformation or you know bias in the data various other things so we need to have those tools uh, and also one other important aspect is to kind of figure out if uh, the models and uh, the llms are being kind of uh, being tricked into generating uh, wrong content uh, so you need to be continuously monitoring their output uh, to make sure that doesn't bring the enterprise uh, into uh, you know uh, reputational risk because there is there is this involved with ultimately your end customers using your uh, gen ai products and that may cause issues so there are guardrails that need that will go as part of uh, both the outputs that these llms generate and also you need to be tracking from a cybersecurity point of view and i think that's also a question is how do you find a put the safeguards in terms of making sure that the uh, prompts that go in uh, are also not uh, you know designed to break the uh, the llm now there are ways you can you know feed in uh, prompts with uh, incorrect information or trick it into kind of generating and we have seen examples of that with some commercial uh, you know um, uh, proprietary gpts now for enterprise that can be a really big problem and you have to make sure that all of those things are tackled at the source being able to kind of build safeguards of what's going into the llm and what's coming out and also that it uh, gels well with the overall uh, the uh, compliance and regulatory landscape of that particular enterprise and the industry it's sitting in because that's a oversight that's present uh, you know it's always on and uh, derek also spoke about this being able to work in that landscape uh, because we have to drive all of that so ultimately we have to make sure that these models uh are able to kind of uh, work in this complex environment but still being able to add value in terms of uh, you know products and services that will emanate from them yeah and it seems like it's going to be you know part people part process part technology and the technology you know for some of the things that you're talking about you know in terms of detecting misinformation and bias you know that's sort of early days for some of it i mean i know that there's been a lot of work right. well, not a lot of work but there's been work done on bias you know like identifying you know bias um and there are some systems out there that will do that you know the detecting misinformation you know that seems like it's it may be part technology part people yeah. I, i don't know how you're doing it where you are and, and uh, yeah and it's a very important aspect right and it can get uh, really difficult even in situation where these models will have to be taken real time data and generate uh, uh you know insights that uh, as they as they're being used for example a contact center so let's imagine like a call center agent speaking to somebody and uh, this a process that generates a script for him to read now if there's an issue with what's being generated and then real time that can cause a situation to be escalated so it has to be really uh, strict you know um, testing and uh, validation of all of these uh, pieces to make sure that they are functioning within the accepted metrics. Yeah, and and there's so many pieces and so much data and I know we were talking about this before, but Ravi, what does scaling Gen AI across the enterprise look like and you know, how do you achieve success there? I know we were talking about that earlier, so it's a good way to sort of wrap up before we go yeah. to audience Q&A. Definitely. uh so scaling is a last pillar uh, that we are talking about as in direct talk of talk about these five pillars and scaling is something that will take you from the experimentation experimentation phase to kind of building out all the pieces around the strategy and the responsible ai and contextualizing to the uh place where you essentially are able to kind of com- com- uh, continuously churn better and better versions that can improve over time uh in a very you know uh industrial fashion so ultimately we want to be able to build these frameworks and uh, tools just like we are able to do today with uh, ml ops uh, llm ops is one place that uh, uh, is an enhanced version with you know strict guidelines and how do you manage to take the llms and put them into production uh, overall the ml ops framework uh, still works but it needs a lot of additional pieces to make sure you are able to create these prompt uh, uh, you know libraries in production you are be able to kind of tune them and kind of try make the embeddings and vector databases also be up to date and maintain and of course uh, that means uh, we have to make sure that there are safeguards in case one of these fails so scaling requires you to kind of build an infrastructure to support all of these now 
uh, of course, that increases the complexity, right? So the more pieces you have, the more likely of something breaking. But uh, the overall, uh, uh, the paradigm is to make sure that uh, there is a there is a way to control all, for all of these and make sure that you are able to generate the output in the right time and the right uh, required uh, you know context for the user. Uh, so scaling will essentially involve all of these pieces and come continuously. Uh, improve the development pieces as well because now there's feedback that will also be generated that will be used to kind of improve the models further down the road. So all of these feedback collection and using that to enhance uh, the models, especially in the enterprise uh, because there's a lot of uh, requirements around accuracy and performance. So those will have to be met. So I think uh, it's an evolving landscape and uh, there are a lot of players and we are seeing a lot of uh, opportunity for kind of uh, helping our customers in this space, uh, going from the journey from even building out a data strategy all the way to the scaling point. Yeah, thank you. Well, this has been a great discussion. Thank you both. Um, I, I see audience questions coming in, so I want to turn it back over to Andrew to do our audience Q and A. Yeah, thank you all very much. That was a great discussion there. Uh, we do have a, a, a few audience questions. Uh, you, you also did a good job of answering a couple of those during the discussion, so I'm going to try and filter through. Uh, I'll start off with this one for Derek, um, but of course, Ravi or Fern, if you have something to add, please do so. So Derek, how do you approach enhancing and contextualizing generative AI to enrich output that is personalized to your business needs? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. And it's one we, we touched upon uh, earlier a bit, uh, but we can certainly go into it because I think it's important. Uh, but consider the airline industry, you know, customers there are, are frequently seeking to modify or cancel their, their bookings, uh, request refunds. Uh, you can imagine managing, you know, queries at this volume um, and, and, and especially the customer demand for a, a swift and accurate response um, it can be a very tedious process. So, applying Gen AI to that seems like a, a good approach. Uh, a good approach to do that, but it requires that domain expertise um, and specifically expertise in aviation that you can plug into those models. So you make it you make that Gen AI solution more meaningful uh, and, and more uh, uh, more valuable. Uh, both to the the airline and to to its uh, passengers, um, I'm of the mindset that many organizations, particularly in the near term, will be focused on fine tuning or augmenting you know that existing model um, uh, with their own specific data you know to from their organization, or it could be industry specific data that they bring on the outside. Um, and I, the reason I say that they're augmenting an existing model is because. Controlling the scope and expense is, is a way to is a way to do that. Um, creating a model on your own can be extremely expensive, very time consuming. Um, so this is, I think, specifically in the near term, that's where you see people focus. Um, additionally, you know the the uh, fine tuning or augmenting a, a pre trained model it starts to limit the the scope of data discovery. So it makes it faster, more efficient. Uh, in that right. And you also are using techniques, Fern mentioned this earlier, retrieval, augmented generation, or RAG, um, and, and that rapidly augments an existing model as well with enterprise or context-specific information, you know, in, in the airline industry example that I, I talked about. Um, it's taking data from structured and unstructured sources, um, and 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 then you're making that accessible into the model that you're using. That's uh, you know open source or provided by a, a third party. Um, in in that regard, there's another bit firm that you touched upon, which I think is important. Um, you see a lot of folks talking about vector databases now, um, and they can using that you're you're able to enrich the models in processing complex relationships between the data that you have as well. Um, so you're seeing all of the representations in a way of bringing in your own proprietary data and other industry specific data that you have access to, but you're bringing that in and, and, and making that connected with the Gen AI models and the LLMs that you're using, the foundation models to make it uh, more specific to your industry, more specific to the relationships that you want to have with your customers 
and your employees. So I think that that's, that's how we're looking at this. Uh, and, and, and again, we've talked about it, but I think going deeper on it and, 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 and looking at it a little bit more closely was, was well worth the time. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, next question here is for Ravi. How are you balancing value creation with cost and adequate risk management? Uh, yeah, thanks, Andrew. So uh, value creation is very important uh, because just like we saw with the AML and even before that with analytics. So ultimately, the business will have to derive uh, ROI in the investments make into this. So essentially, the model cycle, development cycle will have to be quick. So essentially, uh, we have way to way to kind of help customers kind of quickly derive value out of what they're doing, uh, the experimentation, building the data strategy out, and uh, going from there to kind of incorporating ways to control the risk, right? So essentially, we want to be able to uh, figure out all kinds of ways in which uh, this can break and it can, you know, uh, infringe on um, the, either the output uh, having issues or uh, the ways uh, these models can be defeated. So we have to tackle all of those and at the same time being able to kind of drive uh, uh, continuous innovation. So we need to tackle in terms of being able to deliver these uh, at uh, high performance and uh, accuracy in enterprises while um, ensuring that they're driving value. Because if something doesn't work, we have to be able to kind of uh, replace that with another uh, either LLM or another application that works better quickly. And that's the challenge. So it is, it's a learning process for any enterprise. I think there's uh, ways we are kind of creating a step uh, ladder kind of a framework for this. And Derek will be happy to talk more on this, I think, shortly. Thank you. All right, we have one final question before our time is up here today. Um, Derek, this is for you. How does Impetus work with your customers to advance their Gen AI objectives and capitalize on this unique opportunity? Yeah. Well, I appreciate the, the opportunity to answer that question. I, I think it first starts with the, the, the way that we've talked about this um, and, and thinking about what is your Gen AI strategy, you know, and, and how do you put that together? Um, so we have some uh, approaches to doing that. We have a Gen AI readiness assessment or we can come and give you a sense of where you are on that journey um, and really establish a path jointly with you uh, that allows you to evolve from maybe the traditional ML or AI approaches that you've been taking and, and evolve that into where Gen AI is taking us in the AI space. So that starts there from a, a readiness assessment. From that knowledge and from that understanding, now you can start to build what your strategy is. What is that architecture that I need to have that's going to enable me to fully realize what, what Gen AI is, is going to, to provide. And we do that through our data and AI labs. Uh, we have two, two experiences as part of that. The design lab does just that on the strategy side. It's bringing your business and technology folks together to, to talk about it um, and solving it from all those angles, exploring uh, the different considerations and, and walking out of that with consensus uh, across your, your group. Um, and then it quick, quickly pivots into a build lab. And, and the build lab is actually hands on keyboard, building stuff with your data in your environment, with your technology um, and really providing a proof of value. And this is over the course of a week where we're bringing like a proof of value that you have now the confidence that you can move something into production. You have a roadmap to do that. And it provides a, a path to do that, and accelerating that. Moving beyond the labs and the readiness assessment, we have the services that we talked about too. We mentioned the data foundation is so key. So the data unification services, selecting that right LLM and thinking about how do you integrate that within your, within your environment? How do you deploy it? ML ops and LLM ops. And then if you do all of those things, as we said, that gets you to the, 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 the pinnacle of the mountain now you can start building those solutions. Um, and, and then you start rolling downhill. Uh, as you roll those out, you start seeing the value. You start being very accretive to your organization and accelerating the, the time to value uh, as you're developing these solutions. And we help with that custom development as well. So those are the proven frameworks and accelerators um, and for your end-to-end -end journey. 
Okay, terrific. Well, unfortunately, this does leave us with no time remaining today. Uh, but please allow me to thank our speakers. We did, of course, hear from Fern Halper with TDWI, Ravi Shankar, Rao Wahab Josilo, and Derek Larson with Impetus. We'd also like to thank Impetus once again for sponsoring today's webinar. And please remember, we did record today's webinar, and we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version. And if you'd like a copy of today's presentation, go ahead and locate the resource window to download the PDF. Now, it's actually my pleasure to announce the winner of today's special prize, a free three-day pass to TDWI Transform 2024, or to the TDWI Modern Data Leaders Summit on AI and the Enterprise in Las Vegas, valued at over $2,000. Today's winner is Aaron Cho with Capital One. Aaron Cho with Capital One. Congratulations, and we'll be reaching out to you very soon to coordinate that free pass. And for those that didn't win or are unfamiliar, TDWI hosts an in-person educational events quarterly. Our next one is, as I mentioned, TDWI Transform 2024 in Las Vegas, taking place February 19th through the 23rd. And as a valued member of this webinar attendees, we're offering each and every one of you $100 off any event package. TDWI events emphasize transformative learning with over 45 master classes, specialized te technology and programming language specific labs, and a dedicated Modern Data Leaders Summit on an AI in the enterprise where you can earn a certificate. Please check your post webinar communications for a unique discount code and a link to further details. And from all of us here, let me say thank you so much for attending. This does conclude today's event.